I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No said goodbye. Will there be spoken? And time won't matter anymore. If you will learn, I'm longing for you. And someday. Shall be eternal. You will end, sweet beautiful end. I'm looking now across the river where my There's just a few more days to labor Then I'll take my heavenly flight Where my hope shall be eternal, you will sweet beautiful land. Amen. Thank you for that. Debbie and Donnie. Debbie, it's good to have you back. She has been, was very sick, very, very sick and uh, for a long time. So it's good to have her back. And uh, everybody hear me okay? All right. So um, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 10, 2 Samuel chapter 10. If you remember last week, we were in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, the exciting story of Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, and how David showed the kindness to a crippled boy. And uh, remember, context is what? King. If you understand the context, and as you've been following along in the context, every chapter plays a role, even today's chapter. And it's actually, you remember what the promise of David was in chapter 7? What was it? That your throne would be what? Forever, through the line of Jesus Christ, David is so overwhelmed by the gratefulness and kindness of God that what he's doing is 
he's continuing to show uh, the kindness to other people. And so Mephibosheth. Now we get to a very interesting part of the story. It's, it's interesting how we can show kindness to people who are kind to us or we made a promise to or here's this cripple. But David is going to show or attempt to show kindness to a, to a people that most likely you and I would struggle showing any type of kindness to. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, we get into verse 1 and it said, Now it happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died and Hanan, the son, became king in his place. Now, we're talking about a group of people called the Ammonites. Now, if you, have, if you remember any of my past teaching of the different false gods, this is the one that I detest the most, and it's Molech. The Ammonite people are a wicked, wicked people. These people... Or God specifically said, do not interracially marry with these other cultures or whatever. Not because it was a black thing, a white thing, or a brown thing. It was because they were bringing their pagan gods into Israel. And if you remember, Solomon married one of the Ammonite women. And it, the Bible says his heart was torn about which God to follow. The Ammonites were wicked. Now, let me explain who Molech is. Molech is a God who is uh, a calf head and it was, and they had him and his arms were stretched out and there would be a great pit of fire underneath this God's arms. And these mothers would come and lay their babies when the, the Molex arms would get red hot. They would take their babies and they would lay their babies on in the hands of their God Molex. Can't you hear the screams of these babies? The Ammonites were sacrificing their own children to their god, Molech. This gives you an idea who these people were. And so they were enemies of Israel. In fact, there was a treaty that was going to be made with Israel. And King Nahash said... I recommend we gouge every one of the Israelites' eyes out before we make a treaty with them. If you remember this King Nahash, first King Nahash, who killed, who killed Saul? King Nahash. In fact, when the Ammonites would go into a city, they would find every pregnant woman and cut open their stomachs and pull the infant out. I'm trying to paint a picture for you. These are really, really wicked people. And now the Bible says the king of Ammonites, he's died. David should be rejoicing. David should be happy. The king's name is Nahash. Now here's, here's where some confusion comes in. There's two kings. You know, there, when you hear the word Pharaoh, there's a bunch of pharaohs. They're not just one pharaoh that's let my people go. There are a bunch of pharaohs. There were also multiple Nahashes. Okay? The Nahash that killed King Saul is not the same King Nahash that is died, that has died here. It's the second Nahash. And so, we get to verse 2, and then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, this is his son, King's son Nahash, the second Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me, so David sent some of his servants to console him about his father. But when David's servants came to him to, to the land of, of Ammonites. Now, I want to say this, that Molech is a God that they serve. They're, they're cutting women's bellies open. They're pulling these infants out. They're sacrificing their own children. It is a wicked, wicked group of people. And this King Nahash dies and David is getting ready to send some servants. But if you notice what it says, I will show kindness to the king's son. Now, where does all of this stem from? It stems from 2 Samuel chapter 7 when, when God showed the kindness to David. What did he say? God says in 2 Samuel 7, he says, I want to show the kindness of God to someone in the house of Saul. Hey, I know this man. His name is Mephibosheth. 
He's the cripple man. By the way, it's Jonathan's son. We'll bring him here. You eat at the king's table. We go to the next chapter and this wicked, wicked uh, Ammonite people, the, their king died. And he says, I want to show the kindness of God. Now, you know what? We try to have our limits who we're going to show the kindness of God to, right? We're going to be, we're going to have our limits of, well, I'm not going to show the kindness of God to them. Do you know those people were? David didn't see anything, but look, I want to show the kindness of God. If you're a wicked person, if you're a kind person, if you're an evil person, if you're a good person, I want to show the kindness of God to my enemy too. So all of this is stemming from 2 Samuel chapter 7. David's heart is overwhelmed with the kindness of God still and what God has done for him. But here's where it gets interesting. He says, just as this Nahash showed kindness to me, even though at some point, by the way, when did this happen? The first Nahash killed Saul. There's a second Nahash and at some point, David and Nahash, there was this king did something for David. I have looked through Josephus records. I have looked through the scriptures. I have looked through other books that didn't make the Apocrypha of the Bible. They didn't make the, the, the translation of the Bible. I cannot find anywhere where it is written. What did this king, the second king Nahash do for David? Nobody knows that I know of. If you find that answer, let me know. But I cannot find what this king did. But David said, this man showed kindness to me at some point. I'm going to return the favor. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to send some of my servants down to console them. Is that not what we do here at Community Baptist Church? When somebody passes away, what do we do? We make casseroles and we get bojangles and we, you know, whatever. And we go down and we console the family. And so David says he gets his servants together and they may have taken fruit and food and figs and all that. And, and they went to console this wicked Ammonite people. And so we go to verse three and the commanders of an Ammonite said to their Lord Hanan, do you think that David is simply honoring your father since he has sent you servants to console you as David not sent his servants to you in order to explore the city, to spy it out, to overthrow it? Let's begin with some of these words. Do you think? Now, I want to tell you this. You're always going to have naysayers, even when you're trying to do something kind. You're going to have people that are going to say, what's your real intent behind this? What are you really trying to do? What is your real motive? Behind what you're really trying to do. And you can have the purest motives that you possibly can have. But there will be somebody that will say, what is your real plan? What is you really trying to do? And what it is, is Satan is working. Because I want to tell you what. This chapter is so important because of what it spills over into chapter 11. And so we see here that this these people, whoever they were. This young king, his father's gone. Here's the, the leaders. And they said, Psh, do you think? And here's where the two questions. Do you think they really came to console you? What does that sound like? Remember when Satan was talking to Eve? Did God really say that you would not? Did God really say, and they said, did you, did you really think these guys came to console you? Or do you really think they came to spy out on our city and see our weak points or see where we're, where the men are at and to see how the houses are laid out inside of our city walls? Do you think? And so, verse four, so Hanan took David's servants and shaved off Half of their beards cut off their robes in the middle as far as their buttocks and sent them away. And you think, okay, big deal. How many Jewish men you've seen with a beard? Right? The purpose for this is because to shave off a Jew's beard is to consider him a slave. 
They would rather die than to have their beard shaved off. This was all part of humiliation. Okay. Now let's go back through. What did they do to Christ? They tore his clothes off completely naked on the cross. But what did they do to his beard? Isaiah tells us they pulled it out. You see what it does, if the beard is gone, you're pulling out the beard, you're shaving the beard or whatever. It's implying this. I am, I mean, you are my slave and I am your master. What was the Romans telling Christ? Do you think you're a king? You're my slave. What they, when they sent these men back, it was essentially saying, Israel, you're our slaves. We control you. We own you, whatever. And the humiliation, and they cut their robes all the way to their buttocks, all the way. They were revealing nakedness. And this is why they stripped Christ. It was a humiliation. They pulled out his beard. It's a representation of slavery. Verse five. When the messengers informed David, he sent servants to meet them because the men were extremely humiliated. And the king said, stay in Jericho until your beards grow back and then you shall return. And so what happened, somebody came and told David, this is what happened. Your men were disrespected. And David said, don't let them come into the city. This is how embarrassing it was. It wasn't just like, oh, you may see me. They would have rather been killed. And David would not even, would allow them to be exposed to this type of embarrassment. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a great lesson, isn't it? How many times have you embarrassed somebody in front of somebody else and you did it on purpose? And I want to tell you, you ever embarrass your kids or your grandkids and you do it on purpose, the respect for you is gone. And it takes a long time to earn that respect back. If a boss embarrasses their employee, the respect is gone. When you disrespect somebody publicly, the respect is gone. When wives disrespect their husbands, the respect is gone. And here, David said, I will not disrespect my servants. And so he had them stop where they were at. They were most likely in hiding. And he said, look, I want you to go to Jericho. Remember, that's where David originally was. And he had a house there. And he said, you go stay in my house. And when your beard grows back, and he said, there's clothes in the closet. He said, and we're going to make sure we bring food to you. You will not. You will not be exposed to this type of embarrassment. He said, stay there. And so then I, I think this is, I just want you to see David's character in this. Verse six. Now, when the sons of Amnon saw that they had, they had become a rep, the word is repulsive in the NASB. That's the original, the closest Greek word to David. The sons of Amnon sent messengers and hired the Arameans and Bethrob and our Iranians and Zobad and 20,000 foot soldiers and the king and the, and, and, uh, with a thousand men and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. It goes on and on. All of a sudden, somebody said, Hey, we messed up. Now, I don't know how they got the message and I don't know, but look, David is not the one that have, is responding with getting all the soldiers together. They're getting ready for war. And it all started because two men, three men, four men said, hey, do you really think David did this out of the kindness of his heart? And at this point, we have 23,000 soldiers ready for war. And by the way, in First Chronicles chapter 19, you know, this is the other side of the story. It says the Syrians alone were paid a thousand talents to come join. So there's money being involved. There's many, many men. There's going to be a lot more than 23,000 by the end of this story. All these people are coming because several people said, do you really think David did this out of the kindness of his heart? And then it, it, it spiraled from there. And so... The word repulse, I believe, I mean, I know, means this. It means to have a stench about it, to have a stinking smell, to be morally offensive. David didn't do this, but let me tell you, Amnon, the Ammonites, to David and to the Israelites, they stunk. 
I don't know if you've ever been around anybody or even yourself. There's times like, woo, you work hard out, outside and you're like, man, I can't even stand myself. Or you're around somebody that has terrible body odor and you're like, I just, I can't even be around you. You smell so bad. You're repulsive. I'm not going to be around you. And this is the word here that they were repulsed by, by the, uh, by Ammonites. He says, I don't even want to be near you. And they knew that they had messed up. Verse seven, when David heard about this, he sent Joab and all the army. Listen, when David heard that the armies had gathered, he said, okay, then we're going to war. And so David didn't initiate this war. They initiated it by humiliation, but David still did not say, I'm ready for war. But when David heard about him getting the men ready, he said, okay, we're going to fight back. So he gathers Joab. You remember Joab is, is the commander and he's a pretty uh, hard case guy. And, and he says, David knew that this is the guy to prepare all the men. And I just think again, I put in your notes, I think it's amazing how many fights have often began as small quarrels or small number of men. They made the wrong decision. And now all these people are getting ready to die because they did they because what they thought. Verse eight, the sons of Ammon came out and lined up for battle in the entrance of the city while the Arameans, uh, Zobab, uh, Rebob, and the men of Tob were stationed by themselves. Let me just ex explain what's going on here. So the Ammonites came out to the gate of their city and they all lined up. Now, I just can't imagine what 23,000 plus people look like. Can you, by the way, that's just their side and there's a lot more. That's just what's recorded. And then David's people could be 30 or 40,000. Can you imagine 100,000 men in one spot plus getting ready for battle? What that sounded like. And so all of a sudden, here's the Ammonites and they're all in front. And Joab is facing them. And there's something that happens. They look over in the field and they see a group of men coming behind them. And, and this is the Syrians, the ones that they hired. And they were like, oh, Lord. So they got an army in front. They've been flanked. They got an army in the back. And Israel is surrounded. Verse 9. Now, when Joab saw the battle was set against him at the front and the rear, he selected warriors from all choice men of Israel and lined them up against the Armenians. Now, look, he said, Joab saw. So all of a sudden, Joab looked. He sees the battle in front and he sees what's going on around. And he said, OK, guys, here it is. I need some guys going to the rear and I need some guys going to the front. And he started choosing warriors. I imagine these are some of the guys that have been with him the whole time. Men that he could trust. Men that were fighting men. And he selected a certain number to stay in this position. And he turned around and selected another number to fight the men in the back. Verse 10, but the remainder of the people he placed under the command of his brother Abishai and he lined up against them and the sons of Ammon. If you remember Abishai and Joab, their brother was killed, and but, they, but David still put them in charge of the army. And so he said, Abishai, look, this is what you need to do. You need to take these choice men right here, and I want you to fight these guys behind us. And I'm going to take these warriors, I'm going to fight these guys in front. I'm going to be honest with you, I think Joab was probably a little nervous, wouldn't you have been? Like, we just, we just got surrounded quickly. He was in trouble. Verse 11. And he said, if the Armenians are too strong, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Amnon are too strong, then I will come and help you. He said, we got to have a plan. And he said, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know which army's stronger. And I don't know out of us, which is going to be the strongest. I've tried to make it equal as best I can. That's why he chose the warriors. He was trying to make his lines as equal as he possibly could. This is how well he knew his men. Now, this is amazing of how many men he sat there and chose. And he said, look, if Ammonites come this way and we start to fall, he said, I need you to be fighting, looking over your shoulder. He says, and if we start to falter or start to retreat, you're going to turn around and we're all going to go against the Ammonites. And if we beat them, we're going to turn around and we're all going to go against Armenians. He said, this is the plan. He said, but I pray that both of us are able to stand our ground. And then I like what he does here. He says, verse 12, be strong and let's show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people, 
the cities of our God and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. I love what he says. He said, now listen, here's, here's Joab's pep talk. Everybody listen here. Everybody got your attention. We are completely surrounded, but I want to tell you, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Now, this is what he's saying. For the sake of the people in the cities and God, he said, for our people, for the children of Israel, for God's people, for the cities that we have, Jerusalem and Jericho. He said, for what they will come and do to our families, for what they'll take over the land that we just got and for our God. And what was he saying? He's saying, we have a reason for what we fight for. If you've ever done any research in, in your in your college classes or high school classes in your uh, history of civ classes, they'll uh, talk about World War II and World War I. And I, I, I can't imagine World War I. I can't imagine with the, with the with the mustard gas, with the trenches, and they're literally in slop. They had the 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 rot foot. And I mean, I just can't imagine what those what that was like. Not that any war is great, but World War One especially is they these guys do not get the credit that they deserve. And they would say that these soldiers on both sides would be sitting in slop and mud and and urination and bowel movements, trying to sleep with their head against each other and just covered in stench waiting for the next bomb to find on them or the mustard gas to come with not really great equipment. And they would say, I'm done. I'm tired. Both sides, especially towards the end of World War II, they said that the Germans, these soldiers were just given up by the thousands. They were done. Why? Because they, what purpose are we fighting for? What's our purpose? What's the plan? And so Joab said, look, we are surrounded on all sides. Let me remind you of the purpose for our own families, for our cities and for our God. And he says, at any point that you think you can't stand up, I want you to understand the purpose for why we're here. We didn't start this. But then he said this. May the Lord do what is good in his sight. May the Lord do what is good in his sight. You know what Joab said? God, if I live or if I die, whatever your will is, that's what you'll do. How many times do we pray that? Whatever you want, then that's what you want. By the way, that's going to happen anyway. If you want it or not, that's what's going to happen. But Joab, it shows where he's at. He said, guys, listen. He said, be strong and be courageous. Think about your families. Think about the city. Think about your God and who you're fighting for. And look, it is all in his hands. We are completely surrounded right now. Abishai, we are completely surrounded. Guys, we are completely surrounded. If God wants this to happen, then it's going to happen. He is going to give Israel the victory today if this is his will. But don't forget what we're fighting for. Verse 13, so Joab and the people who were with him in advance, the battle and the Armenians, and they fled. I, I love this. This is exciting to me. It does not say that Joab pulled out his sword and they were cutting up each other and they were stabbing each other. It says that they said, okay, guys, be strong, be courageous. God is in your hands. Let's go. And they took a step and all of a sudden, everybody started running. I don't know about you. That's exciting to me because you know who put the fear in their hearts? The Lord. Do you really think that they had them completely surrounded? Do you think they scared them? Do you think Israel scared them? No, absolutely not. It was God who put the fear in these folks heart. And they fled. Now, let me tell you why verse 12 is so important. These people have been paid. The money 
was already in their pocket and they're running. You know why they ran? Because God, they feared. God put the fear in them, but they didn't have a purpose. There was no purpose. What are they going to fight for their, the false God Molech? There was no purpose in their fight. They fled. And when we don't have a purpose in our life and we don't have a plan in our life, we will tend to bounce from one thing to the other. And then he says in verse 14, when the sons of Ammon saw that the Armenians had fled and Abishai had entered the city and Joab returned from fighting against the sons of Ammon and they came to Jerusalem. And so here, the sons of Ammon, they looked and they were like, they're running away. So what happens to them? They ran away. Now everybody's retreating. So Joab says, thank you, God. And he leaves. This, this is a huge mistake, by the way. Joab didn't pursue them. He didn't chase them into their city. And he didn't kill them. And look, is that what they deserved? Yeah. And you're going to see in the next chapter how critical this mistake was. And they came to Jerusalem. I can imagine victorious as they were. And Joab sharing what happened. He was like, they just took off running. We didn't even have to kill anybody. I mean, look, this is what happened. And then we get to verse 15. When the Armenians saw, I'm sorry, the Aramans saw that they had been defeated by Israel. They assembled back together. Oh, somebody said, regroup. The Aramans, when they ran off, they were stopped and said, the Ammonites said, hey, give us all our money back. Something happened for them to regroup, or it could have been they said, now Israel's coming after us. Now we're going to be their slave. People... We'll hear about it and, and they'll destroy us. Regroup. And so what was it? The embarrassment of running from Israel? The money that would have to be given back? Other nations would start attacking, attacking them because of their cowardness? I don't know why they reassembled, but they reassembled. Now, I want to say, what if Abishai would have chased the Aramans and killed every one of them? And what if Joab would have chased the Ammonites right into their city gates and killed every one of them. There would have been no reassembling. Verse 16, And then Hadazar sent word and brought the Aramans and be, were beyond Euphrates, and they came to Helam and Shoabak, the commander of the army, and Hadazar led them. Okay, so now we have uh, Hadazar, and he is leading them, and they're regrouping. That's all it's saying. Verse 17, Now when it was reported to David... He gathered all of Israel and crossed the Jordan and he came to Helam. And then the Armenians lined up against David and they fought him. Who is leading the army now? Not Joab, not Abishai, King David. He left his, he left his palace and he started fighting. He fought the, the men who were behind him, the ones that regrouped. He is, he is doing something different. He is not letting them run. He is coming after them to kill them. Verse 18. But the Aramans, they fled from Israel and David killed 700 chariots, chariots uh, men who drove chariots, and of um, Aramans, of 40,000 horsemen, and the commander. He all died. David killed them. Listen. Uh, 700 men with chariots and 40,000 men on horses. When they regrouped, they regrouped. Can you imagine 40,000 people dead on the ground? What that must have been like. You see, David had given grace at the very beginning. He didn't react. When the beards were shaved. He only responded to the war. Then when they ran. He didn't chase them. But when they regrouped. He went to utterly destroy. This group of people. 
When all the kings and servants, verse 19, saw that they had been defeated by Israel and they made peace with Israel and served them, so the Aramans were afraid to help the sons of Ammon anymore. So all of a sudden, these nations, now this is very important, these nations that were paid off by the Ammonites, they said, treaty, you just killed 40,000 of our folks. Can we be on your side? But who did not join the treaty? Who didn't join the treaty? The Ammonites. There was no battle because Joab didn't chase them. They still, still are enemies of Israel. Can I give you a little taste of, of Sunday night? What's verse 11? David and Bathsheba. And who was, you know, the, you know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? You've heard it all your life. Do you know who he was supposed to go fight? The Ammonites. You know what he did? He stayed home. Because they didn't go kill him in the previous battle. And they didn't have sign a treaty with Israel. David should have utterly destroyed them at that point. And he pays. Because he didn't in the next chapter. Father, we love you today. We thank you for this evening. God, we're seeing how something so small can lead to one thing after the other. God, it's amazing, though, to see David's kindness even to the enemy of Israel, to such a um, terrible people. And God, I pray that as we are enemies and as your son specifically said is to be kind. And David was showing that kindness despite of their past dealings and their wickedness, their false gods. He was simply going to show kindness. Father, help us to have the same attitude, not only to the cripple, but also to the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I will say that um, I want you to please uh, pay attention to the half sheet of paper. Write down any questions uh, that you have for February uh, 20th and uh, continue to pray for this, this service uh, Sunday morning. We're very excited about this. We do not know uh, what's going to take place. We may have 40 or 50 children running around. Um, and so, it, so we're excited about uh, what's going to take place and, and, and how it's going to go. And we don't have all the answers yet. We're just going to grow along with it. And so thank you so much for being patient and working with us, uh, through this time. And, uh, we're, we'll, we'll, things will level out, uh, and, and hopefully soon. And so, uh, we appreciate your prayers for all of this. And I want to finish with saying, uh, you need to pray for Sean story. This is James and Becky's story. This is one of our missionaries that I had on the sheet of paper. Um, uh, they, um, were doing surgery today for his pancreatic cancer. They opened him up and set him right back up. And so they're going to, uh, talk about, uh, other treatments. And so these are our missionaries that were staying down here in the mission house for five weeks. And so, um, they're going to talk about different, uh, plans for him. So, um, I just continue to pray for this family and, uh, the Sean, um, Sean story, but, um, also James and Becky's story are, are missionaries that are retired. So we're going to, we're going to, um, have a time of prayer right now for Sean. Father, we do, um, come to you again and we ask for your help for Sean, Lord, and the news that they've received today. And God, I pray that he would come about it in his life too, that he's going to have to trust you and place it in your hands. Lord, if there is a way that he can be healed through modern medicine, God, I pray that you would give the doctors wisdom for this. But we know that you're going to be the one who is going to have to give this knowledge and wisdom and um, and prepare to heal. We just ask for this family. I pray that you'd come for them this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you and good night.